I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, in a three-day span, two different women named Mary Morris were murdered under eerily similar circumstances. A bizarre coincidence or a confused hitman? Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, with my irreplaceable co-host, Alice. Well, gee, thank you. (laughs) Uh, Does that mean that at some point you were thinking about replacing me? I was going to say, I know, because I looked really hard and I just couldn't find anybody. So I'm stuck (laughs) with you, I think, is the, (laughs) the conclusion we can draw. You know what? I will settle for it. That's all we have. <laughs> <laughs> well, Judge, that's oh, all we you're have. The best, Alice. You know that. <laughs> you are too. Um, well, I really am glad that you're feeling because you've been. Well, I was sick in one of the Delphi episodes, and when I listened to that episode, I was like, "Oh, I don't, I don't sound so good." <laughs> and I think someone said we sounded sad to our listener who thought I was sad. I was just very sick. Now we've switched roles, and Brett, you're feeling sick. Yeah. Yeah, I had to edit out all of Alice's coughing during that Delphi <laughs> There was so episode. much coughing. I probably have to do the same thing. There was a lot of coughing. There will be coughing on my side. I had the I had the COVID test, and I did not have COVID, so that's good. I'm just, I don't know what's wrong with me. I will tell you, when they stick those, those, those cotton swabs up your nose, I mean, it's like, I, I mean, it really feels like they're going to touch your brain or something. Ew. I don't know. It's crazy. So I feel you, all you guys out there who've had to have COVID tests. What I can't imagine are these people who play sports, who have one of those tests like every day or every other day for how three long, or four months. How long That's did crazy. it take, the swab? I mean, it was only, I mean, it was only like a second with each one. I mean, they do two, you uh-huh. know, but they jab it up in there oof, and then oof. pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've heard it described to me multiple times, and that's what people say. It's just, it feels like your brain is being touched. Yeah, yeah, it really did. And then, like, it just made me, it tickled, right? So, like, I'm, like, laughing uncontrollably after they do it, <laughs> but not in a good way. <laughs> and you're, like, also feeling really... sick. <laughs> right. So, uh, anyway. The challenges, the challenges. 2020 So the gift that keeps on giving. Keeps <laughs> well, on th- giving. this is another gift that keeps on giving. Our podcast, 2020. I know, I know. <laughs> and here we are, almost at the end of 2020. Happy December, everybody. I hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. Uh, looking forward to Christmas. Alice, you got all your Christmas plans in place? I, I have no plans, but I do have my decorations up, which I know is, uh, well, by the time this comes out, um, it won't be that early, but I decided we needed extra cheer earlier this year, so decorations are up. I think that's a great idea. That's a great idea. And hopefully this podcast is bringing some cheer to all you guys who are listening. We have for you today what we think is a really interesting case, and some of you have heard this case before, and I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, and I don't want to build up the expectations too high. But you are going to hear things in this podcast that you have never heard before about this case. A lot of people who deal with this case, even even good shows that deal with this case, I think have done it on a very surface level. And they tell basically the same story. There's this case, the Mary Morris murders, is famous because it's two people with the same name who live in the same town who are murdered in very similar ways only a couple days away from each other. And that's led a lot of people to think about, you know, the Terminator and maybe a hitman who went into the phone book and read the wrong name and killed both people. And most of the podcasts that you listen to really focus on that aspect for obvious reasons. That's a really interesting thing. We're going to talk about that, but I got to tell you, there is so much more to this case. And I want to just go ahead and lay down a marker now. This is a cold case. 
It's two women who were murdered 20 years ago. Both these murders can be solved. And I hope that people in Texas in particular, and people in Houston in particular, who listen to this podcast will put some pressure on the local authorities to really look at this case again, because there's a lot of stuff to this, and there's just a lot more that I think the police could do here to really solve this case, and I don't think they're doing it right now. And Brett, you know, this this case hits home to me because Houston was my home for several years. Um, so I'm very familiar with um, kind of the where this takes place. And so I agree with you. I think this could be solved even though it's been sensationalized, but no one's really dived deep into the cases. And I hope we do that today. Yeah, and there's some obvious questions that need to be answered. There's some obvious people who need to be looked at. A lot of you have seen the Unsolved Mysteries episode on this case. It's not from the newest Unsolved Mysteries. It's from the old show with Robert Stack. And even Unsolved Mysteries didn't do a very good job with this case, particularly the um, the first Mary Morris. So we're going to talk about all that. This is probably going to be a multi-episode show. Really interested what you guys think about some of the stuff we managed to uncover here. You know, we're not an investigative podcast. Usually what we're doing is we're looking at the facts that we have, the public record, and sort of analyzing that for you based on our experience. But on this one, we were able to do some 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 deep dive on this case and really learn some things that nobody's reported on before. So we're looking forward to getting to that. So I'm not going to tease you anymore. We'll just dive straight into the story. I'm going to take you all the way back to... 2000, which, you know, doesn't seem like that long ago for me, but it's been 20 years, which is hard to believe. And it's Thursday, October 12th, 2000, and it began like any other day for banker Mary Lou Morris. At 6 a.m., she kissed her husband, Jay, goodbye, and left her Baytown, Texas home for work at the Spring Valley Chase Bank in Houston, Texas. It would be the last time he would ever see her alive. Now, Alice, you said you're from Houston. Can you set the scene for us a little bit? What is Baytown like? How close is it to Houston? All that? Houston generally is one of the top three to five largest cities in the country. And so Baytown, technically, you know, it's to the east of it without traffic. And I say without traffic because anyone who knows Houston knows traffic is just horrendous. Without traffic, it's about half an hour just to the east. And Baytown is considered a much smaller town in comparison. But I think today or last year, there were like something like 75,000 people in Baytown. So 75,000 people is not the smallest of towns. But when you're a neighboring town to Houston, you can imagine how it's a sleepier, quiet town, family oriented. And it's not uncommon that people will live in Baytown or any of the surrounding areas of Houston, but drive into Houston to work. It's by the water. All of this, you know, Houston is close to the Gulf of Mexico. Baytown is what it sounds like. It's a bay town. It's kind of right on the water right there. And that was the kind of community that these folks lived in. Very safe kind of place. I don't know if you can say you wouldn't lock your doors there, but not the kind of place you would expect a horrendous murder to occur. But Mary leaves her house that day, and her co-workers become concerned when she doesn't arrive at the office. That was unusual for the normally reliable Mary, not the kind of thing they would expect. Her husband tried to call her a couple times, but to no avail. Also unusual. Usually, Mary would talk to her husband at least once or twice a day. At some point that day, Mary's supervisor actually called her house to see if she was there. She reached her husband. He said, she's not here, she's at work, and in something we'll discuss, a very unusual circumstance, the supervisor just says, okay, and hangs up. Doesn't say anything about the fact that she hasn't arrived. But by 5 p.m., Mary's husband is getting concerned. She hasn't come home, she hasn't contacted him all day, and he reports his wife missing. But she wouldn't be missing for long. That evening, a man riding an ATV down a remote stretch of back road came upon something he did not expect, the smoldering remains of a Chevy Lumina. The man called the police, and inside were found the severely burned remains of a body, identified later by dental records as that of Mary Lou Morris. Someone had poured accelerant all over the body and lit it ablaze, and Mary's body was burned so badly 
that police could not determine her cause of death, nor could they pinpoint a motive. Yes, her purse had been taken, but expensive jewelry remained on her body, except for one very important piece, her wedding ring. And you know, that that's interesting because I don't know about you, Brett, but I always wear my wedding ring. I don't think there's a single day. I it, This is bad. You should probably take off your most in, uh, valuable piece of jewelry sometime to clean it or to keep it from getting bent, but I always keep it on. And so if I'm found without my wedding ring, I think someone took it from me. And I think that was the story with Mary as well, that she also was somebody who you would never find her without her wedding ring. So the fact that she was not wearing her wedding ring that day, or at least the wedding ring wasn't found on her body, seems significant. And it's also interesting, and has led to a lot of speculation, that that was the only piece of jewelry that was missing. Now, the road where the car was found was only three miles from Mary's home, but it was in the opposite direction that she would have driven on her way to work that day. Moreover, no one could think of a reason why Mary would be driving down this isolated back road if she were doing it on her own volition. Mary had no enemies. Suspicion fell immediately upon her husband, Jay, but he was quickly ruled out as a suspect, as was her ex-husband. Although no one ever knows exactly what goes on behind the doors of the home, the universal opinion, at least at the time, of those who knew them, was that Mary and Jay had an ideal marriage. Mary was known as a happy, friendly person, well-liked and well-respected by her friends and colleagues. No one could figure out why anyone would want to hurt Mary, and the police were baffled. Even more baffling was the phone call the Houston Chronicle was said to receive the day after Mary was found dead. All the man on the other line said was, they got the wrong Mary Morris. After Mary's funeral, her daughter, Marilyn Blaylock, called the coroner to see if she could recover what was left of her mother's jewelry. The coroner told her she could, after they'd finished preparing her body for burial. And that must have been freaky. <laughs> Can you <laughs> I mean, imagine? I just can't even imagine what that was like. I... Even uh, though I know that's part of the story, reading that out loud is stunning because you have just buried your own mother. And that's exactly how uh, Marilyn reacted. She was stunned and disturbed. Had they just buried the wrong body? Because she was at the funeral. She saw the body in the casket be lowered into the ground. So imagine everyone's surprise when they discovered that another Mary Morris had been murdered only three days after Mary Lou's murder. Mary McGinnis Morris was a 39-year-old nurse practitioner. She was well-liked at work, and she loved her job. That is, until Dwayne Young started to work there. For reasons that have never been clear, Dwayne and Mary did not get along. Now, reports vary on just how bad things got. Whether it was simple dislike or whether Mary was essentially stalked and harassed by Dwayne. At some point, Dwayne tried to get Mary fired, but he found himself on the chopping block instead, and he gave his employer his two week notice. Then things escalated. Mary came into her office to find her desk rearranged and her pictures face down on the desk. Talk about a power move, Brett. <laughs> I mean, that's that talk about disturbing, right? If someone did that to my office, right. that's not just taking someone's office chair. That could be seen as a prank. But to, to put all the pictures face down is almost like a threat because right. the pictures are probably of your loved ones. Now, exactly. Mary sees this. She walks over to Dwayne's desk and saw, quote, death to her written on his desk planner. Dwayne was told not to come back to work. But now... Mary was scared. She asked her husband for a gun, and he showed her how to use it. And then he put it underneath her front seat of her car. It was the same gun that would be used to kill Mary. And, and so, at this point, I just want to say something. We've been going through this story, and we're telling the story in a specific way. And I probably should have said this before we got started. 
this is the story that you always hear. So we are telling you the story as it is generally known. If you listen to any other podcast, if you read any articles, if you watch Unsolved Mysteries, this is the story that you're going to hear. We're going to sort of pull a bait and switch on you at some point because we don't actually think this story is true. There are parts of this story that as we looked into it more, more and more of it fell apart. But we want to give you the story as it is generally known, and then we want to kind of pick it apart. So keep that in mind as as we continue to go forward, because there are things that we have already told you that may be true, but there's certainly reason to think they're not. But continuing with the story, Mary met her friend, Laurie Gimmel, in the clinic to give her a flu shot on October 16th, 2000. After Laurie left, Mary headed over to a Eckerd drugstore. I don't even know if there are still Eckerd drugstores or not. There were when I was growing up, at least. There were when I was growing up, too. But I don't know <laughs> if they're still in business or not. Someone would have to let us know if Eckerd is still a going concern. At some point, Mary is she's at the Eckerd, and she calls Laurie on her cell phone and tells her that she spotted someone who was giving her the creeps. And this creeper was someone she thought was a friend of Dwayne Young and possibly someone she met at a Christmas party at his house. But whoever it was, she apparently wasn't so creeped out that she wasn't going to go back to her job and log out of her computer. Why she hadn't logged out of her computer before, I don't know. And weird that you would have to manually log out. Typically, computers just go naturally log out, right? Right. Uh, we'll talk more about that later, but I, I just want to sow some little... seeds of doubt. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, twelve minutes after this call ends, Mary calls nine one one. The contents of this call have never been released, but it records Mary's murder. According to a detective on the case, he said, "Quote: Anybody that's ever heard that tape has just had their blood chilled listening to it." It is a very chilling, disturbing call. The medical examiner determined that Mary had been beaten and shot to death. The killer apparently tried to stage the scene to make it look like a suicide. Investigators found blood on the passenger door, which was left open, and the keys were outside the car. There was also evidence that Mary had been bound and gagged, and she had defensive wounds on her body, making the staging of the suicide somewhat bizarre. Mary's husband, Mike, had been at the movies with his daughter at the time of the murder. In the aftermath, he and Dwayne would become prime suspects of the police. Mike refused to take a polygraph, and he wouldn't allow his daughter to take one either. He claimed he was concerned that medication he was currently on might interfere with the polygraph's results. Shortly before the murder, Mike confronted Mary about an affair he believed she was having. He also confronted the person he believed that she was having an affair with. Both denied it. Mike also had a life insurance policy on Mary. We've talked about this before, about how no one can ever decide how much a life insurance policy is worth. And this one is valued somewhere between five hundred dollars and $700,000. Finally, and this is something we're going to talk about a good bit, investigators discovered that Mike had called Mary's cell phone around the time that she was murdered, and this call lasted for four minutes. They believe that it's possible Mike might have been calling the cell phone to actually speak to her murderer. Mike, for his part, claimed that he did call Mary, but that she didn't answer the phone. And instead, he just let the phone ring for four minutes. The phone company has the call listed as answered, but Mike denies that. And one other thing, Mary was not robbed, but she was missing a ring she always wore. So that's the story. I mean, you can already see sort of the uh the parallels the makings of an interesting mystery just based on what we've already told you you have these two people same name 
murdered in very similar ways, both found in their cars, both missing a ring they always wore. And it makes you wonder, are these murders connected? And that's something we're going to spend a lot of time on. But before we do that, let's just run through the timelines. Alice, do you want to take that? And to further add to the mystery, seemingly we see the motive for the second Mary's murder, but there doesn't seem to be a motive for the first Mary's murder. It doesn't seem to make sense why she would be the target of a murder. And that's the way the, the story is always told that way. That's I right. I mean, usually, and like I said, I feel like we're, we're, we're trying not to mislead you guys, but we are kind of. So usually when you hear the story, it's like the, we barely even talk about the first Mary. You know, you talk about the first Mary just to set up the fact that there was a first Mary Morris who was murdered. And then you talk about how she had this perfect life and nobody would want to kill her. And so then you just move on and you talk about the second Mary Morris. And it really is set up. The story is always set up that this is there's a hitman, right? I mean, I'm sure you're already thinking it. Those of you who don't know the story, you're already thinking it. There's a hitman. And he, got he killed the wrong Mary, the wrong Mary Morris. <laughs> He Mary took Morris. the ring, yeah. and Mike saw the ring and said, what the heck is this? This isn't my wife's yeah, ring. You got the ring. wrong Mary. And so someone calls yeah. the Houston Chronicle and says exactly that. You got the, They got the wrong Mary Morris. And it mm -hmm. makes sense the way it's told. And now we're not tr we aren't trying to mislead you. The reason we're setting it up this way is because it's important for you to know the story that keeps being told and how we're going to debunk it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So – but continuing down this path, let's talk about the timeline. Let's talk about the timeline. And they're pretty short for both of them. October 12, 2000, at 6 a.m., Mary leaves for work. At 10.20 a.m., residents report smoke in the area where Mary's car would be found. But the fire department declined to investigate, assuming that it was just burning leaves. The police find... Mary Lou's body later that night after her husband reported her missing around 5 p.m. Now, you may have already noticed something unusual about this timeline. Mary leaves her work at 6 a.m. Residents report smoke at 10.20 a.m. That's a pretty big gap of time between when Mary leaves her house and when the car is found in sort of a smoking ruin. Especially because we know she was found just three miles from her home. So three miles doesn't take that long to drive. So what happened in that four plus hours? Right. I mean, even if, even if you imagine that Mary was, say she was, say Mary drives down the road, she's going to get gas. She goes the other way because she likes that gas station better. She stops at the gas station. Somebody sees her there. They carjack her. They take her to this remote place. They do horrible things, and they murder her, and they set the car on fire. How would that take four hours? It, it just, it just, I don't know. We'll talk about that more later, but it's, it's unusual. Right. We've talked about this. Typically, you know, the perpetrators are not looking to stay around to get caught, right? <laughs> Especially when it's a murder. We'll talk more about how she died and how we think she died, but you just don't think they're sitting around with, with someone who they either have to restrain or that they've just killed. But anyways, a few days later, on October 16th, 2000, now this timeline is a little less clear. Mary McGinnis meets Lori to give her a flu shot. She then goes to run some errands. She is at the drugstore when she calls Lori to report someone weird is following her. Twelve minutes later, she calls 911 and is killed. At around the same time, Mike initiates a four-minute phone call to Mary. And that's really all we know about that timeline. Yeah. And we're going to talk a lot about that four-minute phone call. We're going to talk a lot about Mike. And we're going to talk a lot about Laurie and this drugstore and everything else. It's This case is so full of interesting things to talk about. And I just I just can't believe this case is not more famous. I really feel like it should be. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping people will, will really dive into this. So look, let's talk about some weird things about this case. And looming over this case is this whole hitman thing. Was it a hitman who, who just got it wrong, okay? And I know that sounds crazy, but basically what you have to imagine here is, I mean, hitmen, 
unless you're like a mob hitman, this this hitman is probably not the most sophisticated person in the world. He's probably not the greatest hitman. I and mean, we were not not talking about like a you know a professional assassin here or anything. So you would have to imagine somebody who basically knew this person's name, Mary Morris. Maybe they have a photograph. Maybe they had written down the the address and lost it. So they show up in Houston. They pull out a phone book and go find Mary Morris. And this could they have mistaken these two and, people? And Brett, this is just ridiculous because I noted earlier that Houston, Texas, is one of the largest cities in America, right? And can you imagine how many Mary Morrises there would be in the phone book for a any town, but especially one of the top five most populated cities in America? It seems like this would be the worst hitman of all time. I spent a lot of time on the internet trying to find a Houston phone book from 2000. (laughs) Like, I searched and searched, and there are some Houston phone books, but they're in libraries, and the libraries were closed because of COVID. So if you're in Houston, you could probably go down and figure this out. But my question was, could someone have gone through the phone book and found the wrong Mary? And you think, maybe. Maybe that's possible, but there's a couple of things that make me wonder. Number one, both Marys were married. Would their names and addresses have appeared under their names, or would they have appeared under their husband's names? I don't know which way they would have appeared, but, you know, you can imagine that it would be like Mike and Mary Morris, or Jay and Mary Morris, or whatnot. In which case, you would think the hitman would know, well, Mike hired me, so that's the one I need to go after. But I don't know if that's the case or not. If they were listed under their own names, what order were they listed in? And were these two Mary Morrises the only Mary Morrises? Now, if it was Mary Lou Morris and Mary McGinnis Morris, then you would come to Mary Lou first. She would be the first one if those were the two names and that's the way they were written. But I just don't know I just don't know what the actual situation with the phone book is, even if you did have the worst hitman in history. And remember, you typically have to pay for a hitman, and a hitman's profession is killing. So to kind of have a freebie kill just to see if you got the right one is a really risky and, frankly, um, poor capitalistic decision for a hitman, to put it lightly. And I just think, and we've talked about this before, that in the modern day and age, it's actually pretty hard to pull off a hit unless you're in the mob. Because how would you move the money without someone knowing? I have to imagine that as soon as Mary Morris, the second Mary Morris, was killed, that the police started looking at Mike's finances to see if he had if he had pushed any money anywhere or if he were, you know, Socking away $100 bills so he could pay off a hitman. Hitman, you know, they may not be as expensive as some people think they are, but they were certainly not cheap. So, yeah, I think even starting off, before we even really get into this, the hitman theory certainly has some problems. Right. Now, this isn't a completely crazy theory, though, at first glance, because these two women share more than just their names. Let's talk about their hairstyles. Although these two women vary in age, if you look at the pictures, and we have them up on our YouTube page and also on our website, their hairstyles really are similar enough that from a distance, one might confuse them. Uh, I mean, take a look for yourself. They're both dark haired. It's curly and short, kind of right around the chin. And so even though, again, you know, one Mary is older than the other, you can, and they're not that far apart. They're about what? 10 years, 9 years apart, um, you can imagine that their hair can make them look very similar. And that's not the only thing that is similar about the women. Their cars are also similar. Mary Lou drove a Lumina. Mary McGinnis drove an Intrepid. Both are sedans and both are similar in appearance. Now, I don't know the colors of these two cars, but again, if... Mary Lou is driving at 6 a.m. in October. It may still be a bit dark. You know, the sun is beginning to rise, but it's still 
kind of a dark time. I'm trying to think right now, you know, we're past October, but it's it's pretty dark at 6 a.m. still. It's not completely light. So I can imagine seeing a sedan and mixing up those two cars. So you've got the similar hairstyle. You've got the similar cars. Then you have the missing wedding ring. And a lot of people think in a very sort of like mob movie style thing that this is evidence of a hitman. In fact, you have missing rings from both women. And you may wonder, do people actually do this sort of thing? Asking for proof of the murder of your wife. Wouldn't you just know if your wife was dead or not? If she doesn't show up and the police come to your house and say that your wife is dead, the hitman did his job, right? But it is possible that you'd want to have proof that the murder had been committed and committed successfully before it became generally known. There's a couple reasons for that. Once everybody knows your wife is dead, there's going to be a lot of focus on you. Not a good time to meet with your hitman to finish the transaction since someone might be watching you. And you can prepare yourself for when the police tell you so you act appropriately shocked and sad and and everything else. So there are reasons to think that a hitman would do this so that you could, you know, know that the the crime had been committed and it's certainly interesting that in both cases you have rings missing from both victims. And you know while it may be sensational to think that um a hitman, you know, they're they're taking the wedding rings to prove that they have killed the right person. To me, it might and it might just be one someone's signature. We talked about signatures in Delphi, or it's pretty easy to see someone's ring. You don't have to unclasp something like you do for an earring or a necklace. You can just slip it off someone's finger. It's something quick to be able to take off. So it might just be that it's a common thing to take because it's of the jewelry that one wears. It's kind of the easiest to take off without having to fumble. Yeah, it it makes a lot of sense, frankly, if that was the way you're going to do it. And the wedding ring or the ring you wear every day or whatnot, probably more distinctive than your average pair of earrings. So it makes sense that you would want to do that. To further kind of, we've been poo-pooing this hitman idea, and I'm going to note one more thing that could cut against a hitman, and that's how close were the two Mary Morrises found. Mary McGinnis was found at the intersection of Fairbanks and West Little York, the 8500 block of Houston. Mary Lou was found three miles from her home in the middle of nowhere, and the bank where she works was at 5000 Garth Road in Baytown, Texas. That bank is 38 and a half miles from where Mary McGinnis was found. That's a 40-minute drive at least. Remember I said that traffic in Houston means it probably is a much longer drive. Now, Mary McGinnis lived in Sugarland, Texas, which is another suburb of Houston, the opposite direction of Baytown, by the way. And Mary Lou lived in Baytown. I mean, truly, these two suburbs are on the opposite sides of Houston. And when I say opposite, they are both outside. There's two loops of highways in Houston. Baytown is all the way past on the east. And Sugarland is as far as you can go all the way to the west. They essentially are just different towns, even though they get lumped into Houston. So if a hitman got the wrong Mary Lou... He got it wrong really badly. I mean, he went to a different town. When you live in Houston, you know what Sugarland is. You know what Pearland is. You know where the Woodlands is. You know where Baytown is. Even though those are all suburbs of Houston, no one would confuse those neighborhoods. And if you live in those neighborhoods because traffic is so bad in Houston, you likely eat in your neighborhood. You likely go to the gym in your neighborhood. You kind of live in your neighborhood because to drive from one neighborhood to another could take more than an hour. So if this were a hitman, he really, really got it wrong because he couldn't even get the town right. I know it's sexy. It's sexy to think it's a hitman. And there's this feeling of how could this be 
a coincidence. And maybe it's not, but the idea, Houston's a big city, big city. I mean, one of the biggest cities in the country, right, Alice? I mean, probably one of the top five millions of people. Yeah. Millions of people live in Houston. This is not some small town. The idea that this person could have gotten this mixed up and not only killed the wrong person, but killed the wrong person in basically the entirely wrong city. We say it's two women from Houston, and that's sort of true, but not really. One of them lives in Baytown, one of them lives in Sugarland. To kind of explain this for maybe a more popular city is imagine if this were New York City and two Amy Smiths were murdered, one in Queens and one in Brooklyn, right? Those are both New York City, but they are very far from each other. And that's not even that apt because there is no metro or subway system connecting Baytown and Sugarland. Right. I think that's a great example. It's a great example. And I feel like this is sort of manufactured. It's certainly the case that two people named Mary Morris were murdered within a few days of each other. And it's certainly true that they lived pretty close to each other, which is a striking coincidence. But it's maybe not as close as some people want to make it out to be. It's true. Their hairstyle is very similar, but they're not identical. I mean, they are similar looking people, and I guess I can see how you would mistake them. Presumably, whoever is wanting to kill one of these Marys knows who they want to kill. So if they've given the person a description and they've given the person a photograph or, you know, their car or something like that, presumably they would give them their address as well. You know, they wouldn't just send them to Houston and say, well, just look it up in the phone book. Right. And even if I mean, they didn't just... get an exact address, I think they would give them the town, Baytown, right. Sugarland. Right. Right. So. And I, and I hate to just, you know, poo-poo the, the hitman theory right out of the gate, but it's probably not a hitman. It's probably not a hitman. We can keep hitman in the back of our minds, but I think we really need to think beyond that. And so as we think more about this, I think we should look at some of the, the other evidence that might be more valuable in figuring out who this is is that committed this crime so let's leave the hitman behind for a little while and just think about some of the weird things that are going on with this case and we're going to bounce back and forth between both cases because even though they may not be related it's it's impossible to discuss these two cases without discussing each other talk about mary lou for a second so mary lou remember she goes to the bank she usually talks to her husband every day on the phone she, he hadn't heard from her. And that day, Mary Lou's supervisor calls her home to see if she's there. And Jay tells this person, without asking who it is and without that person identifying themselves, she's at work. Now, this is weird to me. Mary Lou's supervisor doesn't identify herself, doesn't make any comment on that, doesn't say, well, actually, she's not at work. Doesn't give the husband a heads up. I think this is really strange. I can't, I can't really explain it, it why she would do that. Right. I mean, it doesn't sound like a boss who's calling. The purpose of calling when you're a boss is to inquire where they are. And if they're not at home, to let someone know something might be wrong. She's not at work. But to say nothing and right. not even to identify yourself. Now, maybe, you know, not everyone knows, um, not everyone's spouses know their coworkers. But if Mary's been working there for a while and the supervisor knew her home phone number and felt comfortable calling it, you'd think that they've at least socialized before or met each other at a Christmas party or something like that, right? You'd make some small talk. But to make no small talk seems a little bit strange. And our understanding of Mary is that she's beloved at work, she's a reliable employee, so the boss is not calling to get Mary in trouble, right? Like, she's not calling because she's mad, because there goes Mary Lou again, missing work. She's calling because she's concerned. They're worried about her, and you would think if you were worried about her, you would ask the husband, well, I don't know why you say that, because she's not here 
this is her boss. We're really worried about her. What do you think we should do? I mean, something like that. Now, I don't question the fact that Mike doesn't say anything because, you know, if somebody called for my wife, if we actually had a landline, I probably wouldn't ask who it was. Is, you know, is your wife there? No. Okay. Hang up, right? I mean, that's maybe that's not the best way, but still. But here's a strange thing, Brett. That may not seem weird if someone just calls for your wife and you say she's not here, but how would you know it's the supervisor, right? I, I don't, I mean, well, I don't. You wouldn't. Well, who, how do we know it's a supervisor? Was it from Jay's telling? Because if Jay is saying her supervisor called, I don't know. So that's a good question. I don't actually know where this information comes from. Right. I just don't know because we don't have an actual independent corroborating record of this. All we know, the story that's right. told is that Mary Lou's supervisor called and Jay told her she was at work. Now, who would know this? Because we, the supervisor isn't identified here. So is this being told from Jay's perspective? Because all we know is the supervisor is never identified. So we don't know the identity and we, are, we can't confirm it's the supervisor. The only person identified in this call is Jay. So how would Jay know it's the supervisor and then not ask questions? Because if now, if, if my husband's boss called me, even if I didn't know who they were, but I knew they were calling from work. And they said, hey, is your husband at home? I, if I said no, I would become a little bit worried. So I think it's strange from both ends. Yeah. And, and look, this is the first place where this story starts to show cracks. So much of what we know about these two cases, we just, we know is sort of like, delivered truth or something <laughs> you know this is just this is just what everybody says so that's how we know it and a lot of it's coming from people who may not be the most reliable narrators now we're not saying that mary lou's husband had anything to do with this but obviously the husband is always the first suspect whenever there's a murder so if this information is coming from him and him alone that's a problem if the police were able to track down the supervisor that tells you something I think even as the story is told, it possibly tells you something. And this is what I think it might tell you. So if it is true that Mary has this great reputation at work and everybody loves her and they think she's amazing, they may be protecting her. And this is what I mean by that. Maybe she and her husband don't have the great relationship that we've always been told they have. And maybe... The people at work know that. So Mary's not at work. They call home to see if she's there. But when they find out that she's not, they're not going to tell the husband that because they're protecting Mary because they don't want her husband to know that she's doing something else that day instead of coming to work. That's speculation. But I think, frankly, for me, it's about the only piece of speculation that would explain why the supervisor acts the way that she does. Yeah, I could see that coming. But what I would think that if I were the supervisor, I would ask a couple questions like, when did she leave? Because if she is such right. a if she's such a trusted and reliable employee, it would be strange for her to not even call in, even if her husband didn't know, saying, hey, I just got to take care of some things. Because if Mary were to do something like that, and she knows the type of caring people that she worked with, she'd know that if she didn't show up to work, they would call her husband and if she didn't want her husband to know she better give her boss a heads up so that the boss doesn't accidentally give her away right right and you would also think i mean look i can't explain this this <laughs> this incident or why it went the way it did you would also think that if jay had been calling mary that day as he said at work trying to reach her and then he just sort of randomly gets a call from somebody asking if he knows where Mary is, that he would be inclined to ask, who is this? That it would just be sort of a natural thing. He'd want to know, well, who's calling for her? Can I take a message? Something. But apparently, just none of that happens. This very strange phone call occurs. Nobody on either side asks anything or gives any information. And it just sort of goes by the wayside. I mean, that's the best we can say about it. Right. I think both of our theories kind of crack because... This is strange. <laughs> it kind of defies logic. Yeah, there's no good explanation for it. Right. Now, let's talk about a phone card. So six months after 
Mary Lou's killing, her husband Jay received $2,000 in bills for Mary's phone card, which detectives have traced to a 16-year-old girl from Galveston. Now, to situate you more, Galveston is yet another town south of Houston, about an hour away from central Houston, so yet, you know, far from Baytown, far from Sugar Land. Now, this girl told detectives she found a purse with a phone card and other belongings the month earlier sitting in the parking lot of a Galveston convenience store. Again, keep in mind the map of Texas here. Galveston is not close to Baytown. However, Mary Lou's family did not recognize the purse that the girl said she found with the phone card as belonging to Mary. Around the same time, Jay received three phone calls from someone asking for Mary. The caller remains unidentified, and it is unknown if they are connected to the case. A lot of weird things to talk about here. A lot of weird things. So starting with the caller, one funny thing from this story, it's not a very funny story, but one funny thing is Jay, apparently the last time this guy called, gave them the phone number of the police and said, oh, you should call this number if you're looking for Mary. And <laughs> the guy disappeared and nobody ever found him again. I have read that they were able to trace the number to sort of a local apartment and it wasn't, it was nothing. There was nothing to it. It was a prank caller or something. I don't know if that's accurate or not. Certainly it's never gone anywhere. I want the phone card. The first thing I want to say is about this purse. If heaven forbid I was ever in this situation and the police brought me a purse and asked, is this your wife's purse? My answer would be, I have no idea. You know, like, <laughs> I think, I think, I don't know who else in the family looked at this purse and said, that's not Mary's purse. You know, maybe her daughter would have been better at recognizing the purse or not knowing the purse. But for me, for me, I don't necessarily think it's significant that Jay, if it's Jay, doesn't recognize this as his wife's purse. I, I'm going to push back on that. I'm going to push back. I don't, and I, that's a good question. I'm going to have to ask my husband if he knows what purse I carry. The reason I'm going to push back on this is you may not be able to name the purse she's wearing that day, but typically a woman's purse is something that you don't change out often because, you know, there's a joke that the whole world is in your purse. Like, I don't know about other women, but my purse always has way too much stuff. There's trash. There's my phone, my keys, you know, snacks, just so many things in my purse. And it is way heavier than I should be carrying because it's my life in a bag. And so because of that, I don't typically change out my purse very often. So my purse is something that is seen very often. Even if it blends into the background, you can... I'm pretty sure people would see it and at least recognize it as something that I had at some point. So I'm going to push back on that. As, I don't know. I think maybe they would recognize the purses belonging to her. What's more interesting is if the other things in the purse belonged to her. Right. That's a good question. I mean, we know they never found Mary's purse. We know that, right? So that was the one thing that was missing other than the ring. So it makes sense if a purse was found and it had this phone card in it, that that would be her purse. But I don't know about that question, about whether or not the other belongings in the purse were hers or not. If they were, I guess it's still possible that they just moved everything from the one purse to the other purse. Returning to the hitman thing, if you think it's a hitman, I guess one of your theories could be that the hitman is out of Galveston. Hitman's from Galveston, and maybe he doesn't know Houston as well. As, as Alice does, and <laughs> he wrote down the address and drove up to Houston and realized he'd left it on his kitchen table, so he doesn't have the address anymore, so he has to just find the first Mary Morris he can, and he finds Mary Lou, because her name's the first one in the phone book, and he murders her, and oopsie, gotta fix that, and so he murders the other one. I guess that's, and then he drives back to Galveston, he throws the purse out somewhere, and this girl finds it, and that's that's the hitman story. I guess that's possible. Yeah, I mean, that is that is possible, but again, you know, these are just such disparate places around Houston. They hard, None of these places could really be called Houston. No one really calls Galveston Houston. Galveston has its own 
courthouse that's separate from Houston's. You know, Galveston is truly a different town. And to drive between Baytown and Galveston, you don't even go through Houston. So if you are going between those two cities, I don't think you would say, oh, I'm going to Houston. You would say, I'm going to Galveston, I'm going to Baytown. And so if you were commissioned to kill someone in Houston, you wouldn't even say, oh, I'm going to Houston. Does that make sense? So if you were so if you were killing Mary McGinnis Morris in Sugarland, you would never think to even go to Baytown. Is that what you're saying? Never, never. And here's the thing: Sugarland really is called is a suburb of Houston. And I can imagine if you were going to Sugarland and you were talking to someone you who didn't know Houston well, you would say, "I'm going to the suburbs of Houston." You would not say, I'm going to the suburbs of Houston if you are going from Galveston to Baytown because you don't even pass near Houston. You don't go on the loop. You don't go on the highways that are that service Houston. You can completely miss Houston traffic. So why would you even go to Houston? It would go out of your way. You'd make a triangle with Houston to go from Galveston to Baytown. So if you were going to Baytown from Galveston, even if someone was not familiar with Houston, you would not say, I'm going to a suburb of Houston. You would say, I'm going to a small town east of Houston. I feel like I'm not going to be able to convince you of the hitman theory. <laughs> no, this is this is what's great. We're, don't worry. Don't worry, listeners. We're not fighting. <laughs> the, point <laughs> of this is to, the point of this, I think what we're getting at is none of these facts make sense. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, nothing makes sense so far. And th and that's um, why we're trying to look at this from a prism of, you know, rational thinking. But I think what we're getting at is this. None of this is rational. <laughs> and it's only going to get weirder as we continue to right. talk about it. Right, right. Another thing that might lead you to think that this is a hitman is something unusual that Mike says in the Unsolved Mysteries episode. And you guys should check out the Unsolved Mystery episode on this. We'll link to it online so you can check it out. But on the episode, Mike says at one point that he had nothing to do with the, quote, arrangement of Mary's murder. Now, we don't know what prompted him to say that, but that is one of the weirder ways I have heard someone describe their wife's murder before. Well, now that you said that, I can't think of what I would say <laughs> in that situation. Mary's murder. It's the arrangement just of kidding. that's weird, I, right? I was just trying to be antagonistic. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> no, that is a very strange way to say it. I don't want to nitpick Mike's words. I mean, this is something people do all the time in cases where they're trying to figure out if somebody killed somebody, they look at every single word and ooh he said her name in the past tense that means he knows she's dead or whatever and and i think a lot of that is really overblown but this is a really weird way to say it it makes it sound like he knows that her murder was arranged ahead of time it wasn't just a murder it was a planned murder so for me the fact he says it that way is actually a really weird thing yeah, no, no, a absolutely. It's arrangement calls to mind like meetings, you know? Right, um, right. It's just, it's so formal, an arrangement of flowers, an arranged marriage, something that's very formal. Right. It seems to include information that he shouldn't have, you know? It seems like he knows more about the murder than he's letting on, and he sort of slipped. His, he has slipped up and acknowledged that this was an arranged murder, it wasn't a random act of violence right? It was people made a plan and they go, they went out and they executed it. And he's saying, I didn't have anything to do with the arrangement of the murder. To me, I don't know. I think it's weird. I think that is a, a very strange way to put it. And it just makes me wonder, in addition to some of the other things we're going to talk about, whether or not Mike is a viable suspect. Now, if you're going to think about why you would kill your wife, people always want to know what the motive would be. And like most cases, money is often pointed to in this case, that insurance policy we talked about of between five hundred and seven hundred thousand dollars and $700,000, not entirely sure exactly how much it was. Some people point to that. But there's a lot of questions that I have about that. Number one, when was it taken out? You know, if they'd had it for years, it's a lot less suspicious. You know, Alice, I don't want to dig into your private life, but I have insurance. <laughs> My wife has insurance. You know, that's what you do when you have kids. You get insurance in case one of you, you know, gets murdered by a hitman who's trying to kill somebody else. You need you need the insurance. And 
if they've had it for years, it's just what they do. And it's not really that suspicious. If he took it out the week before she died, that could be a bigger deal. Now, Mary's sister, and I believe also her daughter, have said that no insurance was ever paid out in this case. And that's also interesting. I think there's a question. Why not? Uh, this was obviously not a suicide. And the only thing I can figure is that most policies do not pay out to a beneficiary that murders the, co the covered party. You can imagine why you would have that as a policy if you're an insurance company. So does that mean the insurance company is holding the payment because it's suspicious of Mike? Does it mean they're not going to pay out unless they determine once and for all who, who killed Mary? Is it completely incorrect? Did they pay it out 20 years ago? I'd be interested to hear from someone who is in the insurance business because it seems like if a an insurance company could withhold payment, it is it, it kind of flips a lot of the due process of our courts on its head, right? What Mike has to prove his innocence in order to get the payment. And that could put you in a very difficult position, especially if you are an actual, if you've been cleared by the police or you you are a suspect and you don't want to make incriminating statements or statements that could be used against you in court later on for a prosecution, right? So I, I don't know how life insurance policies work, but I'd be interested in hearing someone on that point. That's a really good question. You know, there's a book that came out last year called Furious Hours, which is actually about insurance fraud and murder, and it involves Harper Lee, and that's sort of the, the hook. Good book. If you haven't read it, you should check it out. And apparently murdering people for their insurance was a popular thing to do 60, 70 years ago. So it would be interesting to hear from insurance folks now. I know back in the day, insurance investigators solved as many crimes as the police did, just trying to prevent having to pay out insurance policies. So I would be interested to know that. It's sort of a open question that sort of hangs over this case. So if you're somebody who knows, do let us know. So we've talked a lot about this case. We've given you the story. We've given you the timeline. We've talked about some of the weird things. We're going to go ahead and stop for now. And if you've enjoyed this episode, the next one's going to knock your socks off. I just got to tell you, because we're really going to get into some of the interesting things that we found out through our sort of investigation into this case. We're going to talk more about Dwayne Young. We have talked to Dwayne. We have talked to Dwayne a lot, as a matter of fact. We have talked to an investigator who has looked into this case and has connections in the Harris County Police, and he has given us some information, which is really, really fascinating. We have talked to people at the Houston Chronicle about this case, and we have information about things that have been reported that may or may not be true. we got a lot of stuff, and by the time we finish, the story that we told you at the beginning of this episode is really going to start to fall apart. And I think you're going to see that this is a much more straightforward case, really in both instances, and that if the police gave this case the attention that it deserves, I think they could solve one or both of these crimes. Has it been too long? Possibly, but better late than never. You know, they should start now if they can. So we're, that's what we're going to hit you with next time. If you got any questions or comments so far, Email address is prosecutorspod at gmail.com. You can find us on all the social medias at, at prosecutorspod. Hello to everybody who's watching this on YouTube. Hello to our Patreons. Thank you guys for recommending this, uh, this case. Very interesting case. It's been a joy to do it. Let us know what you think. Keep leaving those five-star reviews. We love hearing from you guys. Alice, do you have anything else that you want to add? No, that's it, except if you were frustrated as we were in the story so far that you've heard today, come back next time because that's why we started digging. We just weren't satisfied with the story that's been told time and time again. And We can't wait to share it with you. So we'll be back with the rest of the story next time. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutor. It's not nothing. It's more work than I thought it would be. I'm going to be honest. I didn't think it'd be as much work as it is. But.
That's fine. Well, I enjoy it. I mean, well, I can't respond to every comment on Delphi because there's so many. Oh my goodness, I know. Every time I check, there's like another hundred comments. I'm like, oh, I know, it's I can't wild. Keep up, guys. Yeah, it's crazy. I think the craziest part is no one's like attacking us. I totally thought. I know. I did too. Which is nice. I'd rather not be attacked if I can avoid it. Guinness, Lee. <laughs> I'm getting myself mixed up with all the Marys. <laughs> <It's hard. laughs> I know.